Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nicola Moore. I'm the Node Research Manager in Queensland for the Natural Hazards Research Australia. And welcome to today's webinar, which is a project briefing on the expressions of interest for the T1E1 Bushfire Information Database Scoping Study. And before we start, we'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians across all the lands on which we live and work and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We recognise that these lands and waters have been places of teaching, research and learning. And for me, where I'm situated at the moment in Kalanga Dakaba, north of Brisbane, these are the homelands of the Gubby Gubby people. And I'd welcome all of you uh, to acknowledge the traditional owners from the parts of Australia that, that you're all based at at the moment into the chat function as part of that process. As we go through today's presentation, please add any questions that you have into the chat to assist with the flow of today's session. And if someone asks a question that is similar to yours, if you, if you tick that you like it, it will move up to the top of the list and we'll, and we'll know that there are more people interested in the question and can address it during our presentation. I'd like to introduce you to the um, Natural Hazards Research Australia personnel that are with us today. Um, we've got Dr. John Bates, who's our Director of Research Strategy. Dr. Shiva Prasad, who's our Director for Research and Implementation. Vaya Smyrnios, who's our Events Officer and Supriya Gurung, who's our Research Services Project Officer. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide you with further details on this project. The key processes that are required for submission to the expressions of interest and, all the, and any project governance requirements. The answers to all of your questions that will be addressed in the webinar will also be included on the web page under the frequently asked questions section. So in addition to the interest in today's webinar, we've also received contact from a number of other researchers that aren't really interested in applying for the project, but have got potentially relevant data sets, which is really wonderful. It demonstrates a willingness for researchers um, from all across the country to support this project and to collaborate. So now I'll hand over to our Director of Research Strategy, Dr. John Bates, to provide a quick overview of the Natural Hazards Research Australia. Thanks, Nicola, and welcome everybody to the, web, the, the webinar today. So as Nicola said, my name is John Bates. I'm the Research Strategy Director at Natural Hazards Research Australia. And for those of you that haven't had anything to do with this before, uh, we do, uh, the Research Centre is built off 18 years of research through the Bushfire CRC and the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC. Uh, and the new centre commenced operations on the 1st of July this year. Uh, sorry, 2021, we've changed years. Um, and it's supported by a contribution of $85 million over 10 years from the Commonwealth Government, plus partner contributions from uh, emergency services and other departments and the private industry. And the core objectives of the centre are to protect human life and undertake research that contributes to protecting human life and minimising harm and suffering, that contributes to developing and supporting well-prepared and resilient communities, and to invest in research that translates into action. And I think you know, it's really important that the research that we do has to have a path to action, has to drive change. Uh, and we certainly don't do research where we don't have a, a clear path to that delivering a benefit, whether that is an in, increase in knowledge, uh, whether it translates into new practices or new systems and capabilities. And the operating principles for the research centre, um, very much following on that needing to be used context, very much defined by our users. So they are the people who, who are the, the end user partners of the centre. They're framed by natural hazards. We, we are a natural hazards research centre, so all that we do is linked into those. It's contextual, contextualised by research themes, and you'll find the themes that the, the centre is um, undertaking its work under on our website. And it's influenced by a range of factors. Those factors are things like climate change, demographic change, a whole range of things that run right across all of the research themes. And importantly, the work that we do as a centre needs to be useful, usable and used. And I think just as a plug, a new website went live this morning. Uh, so I think there's, if you want to learn more about what the centre is doing, 
what our goals are, what our early projects are, uh, a good opportunity to get on the website and have a browse. And right now I'd like to pass over to Dr. Shiva Prasad, our Research and Implementation Director, to talk to us about the EOI process. Thanks, John. Um, so as I go through the uh, EOI process, please add any questions in uh, uh, via the Q&A function that we've got over there and our team will pick it up. Um, all the information that you actually need for the EI is actually available on our NHRA website. So there's the link there, as you see on your screen, um, naturalhazards.com.au. Um, the uh, Everything from the EOI for the project, additional details, frequently asked questions and submission form, you can find it all there. Um, we will upload these, the, as I think, we will upload these on the chat function for you now. So just, uh, just so that you can get it easily. I think the team's going to do that. If you have any further questions on the webinar, please load them up. And if you have questions after the webinar, there's the email address there, research at naturalhazards.com.au that you can see. Please email us and we'll try and respond back to you as soon as possible. I'll just flick over to the next slide now. So in terms of timeframes, um, the EOI has been open since 16 of February. So that's been just a touch over a week now. Um, we're on, so we're, we're doing the webinar now, and then the EOI is planned to close on Tuesday, the 8th of March of 2022. That's Sydney time, 11.59 p.m. Um, once the EOI has closed, we will look to assess that by early April. So letting everybody who submitted to know the outcomes of the assessment by early April. And then perhaps by late April, we'll try and put together the project proposal, which is the next step. So again, any of these key dates and information you can find on our website under the EOI. Submitting and expression of interest. So the actual EOI process is a two-stage process for the sub, uh, uh, successful applicant. The first stage is that you submit the EOI via our online uh, webpage. Um, with all the submissions, we, what we do then is we go through and evaluate each of the submissions based on a set of key criteria, uh, criteria questions and weightings. Once we've selected one submission, we then go through the second stage. The second stage actually involves a, a project proposal detailed and a plan uh, with our key stakeholders. Once that project proposal has been finalized, we then go ahead and, and attach that to our contract. The contract then gets signed across uh, through us and through the successful applicant and the project starts. So the submission must include, now again, all these details can be uh, are found in the EOI uh, applications um, website. So all submissions must have an outline of the project team, the approach to, of the project and the indicative methodology. They should also have a schedule of work and interim milestones of the projects. They should also have project budgets in line. Please make sure you put the budgets in um, and any in-kind contributions for the, uh, for the work that you're planning to do. That's in-kind. A clear statement uh, describing the outcomes and the outputs that we're gonna gain from, from the delivery of the project. A statement of capability that proposes the capacity and the capability to do the work from each of the team members and a statement demonstrating the team's uh, relevant research experience, as well as stakeholder engagement. And please uh, upload CVs of each of the um, applicants in, in, the, in the team, but please make sure that there are no more than two pages long. Um, again, similar sort of information, the submission form um, lists the entire project team that's gonna be there to um, uh, do the work. If there are people that you have not yet hired, do include them as well um, and, and just notify that you're looking to hire somebody for those spaces. Uh, do include a diversity statement. This is quite important for us. And again, I think proposed approach we've spoken about, indicative schedule of work we've spoken about, the budget uh, statement of outputs and outcomes, capabilities. Risk assessment is an important one, COVID risk assessment. I mean, we're all in COVID times until now, unfortunately. So do please include a COVID risk assessment statement um, and any attachments that you need. Uh, in terms of the evaluation criteria, so what happens after you submit all this information on the closing date and time, uh, we will go ahead and assess them. Um, as you can see on the table on the right-hand side, there's a list of five criteria that we look at. 
So research capability, project approach, outcomes and outputs, industry engagement and value for money. And you can see the weightings over there. So we will form a group of three uh, panel members that would go ahead and assess all your panel responses. And then from there, we will select one and go from there. And from here, I'll pass it back uh, to John. Thanks, Shiva. Uh, just a reminder, we, we're now about to get into the process, you know, talking about the project we're after and what we're looking for from this expression of interest. Uh, if you do have any questions that, that you haven't sent through, uh, do feel put into the Q&A and we'll pick those up at the end. So as, as we go through this section, um, there are questions that have come up and we'll address those as we go. So looking at, at this project, really what we're looking to do is to develop a consolidated understanding of the quality, purpose and availability of bushfire data sets and bushfire related data sets in Australia and to identify important gaps in the data based on local and international experience. And, and for me, the outcomes of that, what I'm looking to, to, to have is, is to be able to build an informed understanding of the bushfire data landscape in Australia. What do we have? What don't we have? Where it is? And what does the quality of that look like? And using that to provide some guidance that will assist in the development of a plan to improve the national bushfire data collection. To, to contextualise where this came from, there were two significant inquiries, or two or several significant inquiries, um, following the Black Summer bushfires. The first was the Royal Commission into National Natural Disaster Arrangements in 2020, uh, where there were two recommendations that really talked to, to needing to have more information um, about bushfire data and about other natural hazard disaster, but we're, we're focusing for this EOI on bushfire, really to have access to national disaster risk information that can be used to understand um, what, what's happening, what's changing, what are the trends in bushfire and bushfire related information so we can reduce disaster risk. Um, and the second related recommendation was around collection and sharing of impact data. You know, what, what happens when a fire goes through and that, that's not just the physical side of things, there's information that is to do with communities recovery, with environmental change, environmental impacts. Um, and the New South Wales Independent Bushfire Inquiry also in 2020 recommended or one of the recommendations was that there was a need to establish a national bushfire database and that that bushfire database would enable monitoring of trends in bushfire activity and impacts across all land tenures and vegetation types. So, so when I talk about land tenures, that is private land, government land, uh, Australian government, state government land, uh, tracking trends and identifying patterns in associated weather and climate signals that contribute to severe bushfires and evaluation of the cost and effectiveness of risk mitigation efforts. So we have a better understanding of what works. So there, there's certainly a lot of interest in bushfire data and that recognition that we need better access to data. Uh, if we have the next slide, please. Um, and it's important for the purposes of this EOI to understand that there are already several initiatives that we're aware of, uh, and there are many data sets. And looking at national initiatives um, Australian Climate Service was formed uh, following the Royal Commission. Uh, it's being led by the Bureau of Meteorology and Geoscience Australia and looking to be, bring together a range of information that can be used to inform government um, on bushfire risk, bushfire risk management, and to, to inform operational decision making. There's uh, a product or project called NBIC, the National Bushfire Intelligence Capability that has been developed by Emergency Management Australia. And the first phase of that's being delivered by the CSIRO. And the Australian Research Data Commons has put together a bushfire data challenge, which has multiple partners, including um, Natural Hazards Research Australia, AFAC, CSIRO, uh, ANU, the Turn Consortium, and others that are starting to bring together information uh, around bushfires, but certainly, um, even with that list there, it's incomplete. And we know that there is a lot of data that exists uh, across Australia in very many places. And we're, we're talking about um, data that is related to bushfire. So it's not just about the, the fires that burn or the way that they spread. It's about things that will increase risk exposure to that, to, to bushfires. It will be weather related. It will, could be climate related. It can be impact on critical infrastructure, could be impact on freight and distribution could be interacted on a whole range of things. And we know that that information exists in emergency service agencies, 
in weather agencies, including the Bureau of Meteorology, land management agencies, research organisations, including the universities, you know, infrastructure owners, including the utilities have those, governments at all levels have data, the, the NGOs have a, a, a rich data set and there are more. And really what we're trying to get out of this project is to understand what is the data that exists, where is it, and whether or not it exists in the collection uh, in a form, a database that is usable and accessible, but, but mostly to really understand what the landscape is in Australia. So what is the data? Where is it? And what's the purpose of each of those? So that we can start then to say, what, what does the next step look like in trying to bring all of this information together? Uh, so what, what am I looking for at the end of this project? Really to understand through a bushfire risk management lens, what data exists that will assist in understanding and reducing bushfire risk? The diversity of available data sets and which of those are accessible in a digital form. Um, I think historically a lot of information has been collected uh, and much of that historically is written on paper uh, rather than being available to, to search in, in a form that we're all becoming much more used to doing. Um, where there are existing accessible data collections, so where are they? Um, what, what do we need to do to get access to those? Where are there gaps in data collection? Uh, what new data sets are or will soon be available, and if there are international examples of good practice. So we'd be looking to the team that, that are successful in this EOI to, to understand what, what is happening internationally and to, to give um, examples and illustrations of where either there are data sets that we don't have, that we could have, or where there are databases that have come together that uh, represent an opportunity for us to learn from how to integrate this information. And, and I think it, it's fair to say that is we're looking at, at social information, we're looking at physical information. It is a very disparate set of information, but the intent behind it is that if we could bring all of this information and knowledge together, that it will actually help us with our collective decision making. And it also means that we won't lose data that has been generated over the years. And I think it's fair also to say that over time we have lost a significant amount of data because of, because of lack of data governance uh, and a range of other challenges that um, mean that we've lost some of that knowledge and it sits in people's heads at the moment who are around, but as they retire, it will disappear. And at the same time, we've got massive increase in, in you know, the amount of data that we're collecting that needs to be analysed. Uh, we don't want to repeat that because there is a limited amount of money to, uh, to put into this. Now, I'm just going to pause there for a minute and I'm going to go through some questions that were asked of us at the beginning. Um, the first question comes from Charles Darwin University asking, will it be possible to develop a consortium of agencies for this project? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, we fully support collaboration uh, across different university uh, teams and others to bring this together. And if you, if I look at where I think the data will come from, there is certainly information that will come from universities, uh, but there is also information that will come from government agencies, emergency services department and others that um, need to be contemplated. So a consortium is certainly encouraged. Um, where can we read further details about the EOI, guidelines for the EOI preparation? That question was from Western Sydney University. Um, they are on the centre's website, and I think Shiva has spoken about that earlier. Uh, if you've got any questions accessing any of that, um, send an email to research at naturalhazards.com.au and we'll, we'll provide that information to you. Um, there is just, our, our communications team did tell us we, we put our new website live earlier today. There are a couple of glitches. If you find that links aren't working uh, and you can't find the information that you're after, again, send us an email to research at naturalhazards.com.au and we'll get back to you. Um, so moving on with our questions, we had a, a few questions from the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, the first one was, are you interested in climate trends from past observation and or future projections from modeling? Uh, the answer is yes. Information like that can be used to contribute to bushfire uh, understanding bushfire risk, uh, understanding the potential for changes in bushfire behaviour. Uh, the second question from the Bureau, uh, would the production of a specialised database of operational uh, and research radar, geostationary satellite bushfires cases be good for this project? 
uh, for this project, understanding what's being, what exists or what's being proposed is important. The project is not asking for any new databases to be established. It's looking at what is the data that exists. But if, if you could describe the benefit of that, what that data is and the benefit of that, um, that would certainly be something that we would be interested in for the, prefer the, the preferred provider to be aware of, to incorporate. The third question also from the Bureau, would the construction of data sets of bushfire case studies, including radar, satellite, in situ and numerical situations be good fit for this project? Again, this project is not intended to develop those databases. So to understand what might exist and what plans are, are there to expand that, that data is of interest, but not the, not the construction of a data set itself. Uh, the fourth question is also from the Bureau of Meteorology asking, is a gap analysis of what observations or combination of observations and modelling we need to advance bushfire research a good fit for this project? Um, yes, a gap analysis is something that we've asked for, uh, and that would certainly include um, observations and modelling from, from a Bureau and other perspectives to understand where there are gaps um, or not in what we're doing. Um, the next question, and I can see we've got at least one in the Q&A, so keep them coming. Um, Next question comes from Disaster Relief Australia, just querying the use of drones for mapping and importing into GIS. Uh, I think, yes, you know, we are looking to um, be able to co collect data as it is being developed and collected now. Um, the project itself is not going to build the data sets, but having a case that will provide information to um, custodians of that data so that it can be made accessible is important. Uh, the sixth question comes from Queensland University of Technology uh, asking, do you require people who understand bushfire in this tendering? Um, that, so people that have domain expertise. The answer to that is it would be difficult to do this well if you don't have a reasonable understanding of bushfire and bushfire risk management and what happens in a bushfire um, in your team. Uh, it, it's not, it's not uh, essential that you do that. But if you don't have an understanding of bushfire, it's going to be very difficult to work out and do a gap analysis or to work out what is important data from a bushfire perspective. Uh, the next question, number seven, comes from RMIT University. How much detail do you require for the part about highlighting areas where new methodologies are being developed, particularly using new satellite and aerial based systems? Uh, and the answer, really is as much as you think is appropriate. We're not looking for um, the, the, the response to the expression of interest to go into massive detail around those new technologies. But I think what I'm looking for with that is to understand how they would contribute to the knowledge that we have, how they would fill any knowledge gaps and how they might reduce our exposure and disaster risk from bushfires. Uh, the next one comes from the University of Melbourne, that's question nine. Uh, what data we are focusing on satellite-based, ground-based, crowd-based, or IAT-based, or a combination of them, we are looking at, for the purposes of this understanding what data exists, we are looking at data from all sources, um, all that we mentioned, and others. It, it could be post-disaster surveys, it's a range of other things, so it is everything that will help us understand what the risk to bushfire from risk from bushfire is, what we can do to minimize it, and what we can learn in terms of what is changing over time and what is predicted to come and how well prepared will we be for that. Now, question number 10 comes from the University of Newcastle. Um, the, 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 it says, I appreciate if you indicate the specific majors you need. I think what, what we need really is to understand what are the major collections of, of data that exist, uh, as I said, probably very much related to the answer of the previous question, that will contribute to a good understanding of bushfire risk. If you look at the, the ARDC, the Research Data Commons, you'll see that there's an interest in bushfire intensity, there's an interest in bushfire fuel load, so what's the vegetation, what will burn, what's the distribution of that. We're looking at impact on um, properties, we're looking at impact on communities, there, there are a vast number of, of areas that data will come from. Um, and the list that I've given you is far from complete. 
um, but I don't intend to go into where all that comes from. We, we are interested in, in your response in, to the EOI to talk to us about where will it come from and how will you access that information. Uh, question 11 comes from the Statistics Network um, who are interested in using some, developing some work around teaching in an undergraduate course. Um, the outcomes of this project will be made public, publicly available so people will be able to look at it and use it. Um, but the, the project itself is not going to be generating new data. It's going to be understanding the data and where it is and where it sits and how to get access to. Um, the University of Southern Queensland have asked, they're keen to know the details of the project scope. Um, the scope of this project really, uh, hopefully I've covered off in the, the earlier slides, it's to understand what we have in Australia by way of bushfire data, where it exists, what gaps there are in that data and what we can learn from international uh, data collections, international approaches to, to building a, a knowledge and understanding of the data that exists um, that, that is being used and can be used to reduce disaster risk from bushfire. Uh, it is not to develop a database um, that is beyond the scope of this project. Uh, going on to questions. So now moving over to the Q&A. We have, uh, what is, so the question is, what exactly is bushfire data in this context? Uh, is this about the events themselves and their impact, or is information about the preconditioning um, of fire, vegetation, fuels, weather, climate also considered? Uh, absolutely, it is, it is all of those things. Uh, it is anything that helps us understand the nature of fire, the risk from fire, the progression of fire, the recovery from fire, and what we can do to stop fire spreading, if that's a feasible and plausible thing. Um, the next question um, from the Bureau of Meteorology is, are there planned links with the ARDC bushfire data set, collect, data set collation activities underway at the moment? Yes, um, it, it's very much intended that the successful tenderer or successful respondent to this project um, will, will be encouraged to engage with that group uh, we'll certainly facilitate that where we can um, and we'll provide assistance to those things that, that as we go. But yes, uh, all of those things are uh, in scope. Um, a question then, do you need to know about the state of the art methods available for bushfire detection or maybe prediction using video and imaging data sets? Um, that would be helpful to, to understand what they're doing. I think there's a lot of data that's being generated. Some of it, um, the purpose is not necessarily clear. Um, but it is, yes, it would be important to know about methods that are being used. We're not asking in this tender to go into them in fine detail, but certainly to understand the different types of data that are being generated and, and as best you can explain it, the use and the purpose of that data. Um, does the EOI also expect to see issues of data quality and data governance as well as proposing a conceptual design to manage the database? Ideally, yes, um, that is, and will be subject to a discussion with the successful provider for this, looking at, at the availability of information that will allow them to determine data quality and data governance, but that is, and they are very important issues with all of this um, and something that as a research centre, we are very much focusing on. And we have a project that we are starting independently with the ARDC to look at improving the quality um, of research data in bushfires and natural hazards. Um, and the last question on the list that I've seen that's come through so far, although the tender is not to develop the database, is there a need in the EOI to explore in advance the potential architecture of the database for usability, accessibility and data governance perspectives? Um, that's preferred. Um, it would be certainly of, of value um, to, to get a sense of what might work. Um, particularly if, if there are examples of where things might happen. We, we my, my sense with all of this is that there are, um, for, for the environmental areas, TURN is a collected database. There's a lot of information on the environment um, in there and vegetation. It would, understanding how all of those pieces could come together would be valuable, um, but it's not, it is not the major part of what we're looking for, um, but, we, I, I would anticipate that the right project team would be able to give us some ideas on how this could be done.
All right. At that moment, I think we've gone through all the questions that I've seen. So I might pass over to Shiva Prasad to, to just have a bit of a follow-on on, on the process for uh, putting in your EOI. And I will speak to you again at the end. If you have any last, any other Q&As to put in, um, we've got time before the end, so don't wait. Put them in the question and answer and we'll answer them before we, we finish up today. So I'll now pass over to Shiva Prasad. Okay, so in terms of governance requirements, so basically once we have selected the submission, a successful submission, we work with the team to develop a research plan or a research proposal. In the research plan or proposal, we'll start to unravel more of the methodology that you had submitted um, in the EOI. We'll start to break down the deliverables, the milestones, and start addressing some of the outputs and the outcomes we've got um, listed in the EOI. So in terms of governance, once a project is completely set up through the research plan and proposal, and then signed off through the contract with the successful party, uh, we've got a few governance uh, structures put in place, uh, basically to make sure that we go to plan uh, to the satisfaction of the center and to the satisfaction of the end users. Um, we've got what's called a project management committee put in place. Um, this team is compromised of the lead researcher, a representative from the center and a representative from the end user uh, group. Um, and basically they are the crux of, of how the project goes. So they will be there day in, day out, making sure that the project is going to plan. Um, they do meet, um, um, they, the meetings can vary from time to time, but if, if a project is going well, they tend to meet once a quarter, um, so forth. Um, in terms of the successful uh, research organization, um, they must prepare that plan, the research plan and proposal, as well as a uh, plain language statement um, using the center's templates. So the center has various templates that we've got in place. So once, some, once we've selected the party, they, they will work with us through these templates. Uh, the project plan must also be approved by the project management committee. And this will obviously become a uh, part of the attachment in the contract. Now the reports are subject to review by this uh, PMC and they are to be endorsed. Uh, the project team is required to ensure a PE review process is undertaken for the final report. So um, apart from progress reports from the team, there's also gonna be a final report that's put in place um, as part of the milestone or the deliverable towards the end of the project. And obviously all these milestones and deliverables are tied to the payment structure that we'll put there. So yeah, I've spoken a little bit about milestone reporting already. Um, in terms of communications, um, to, further, to further go through the quality assurance, it's expected that, that yeah, there'll be regular PMC meetings uh, will be held. So definitely the lead researcher who will represent the research team would have to take part in these PMC meetings. Uh, the project team will use a consultative approach. Sure, it's uh, quarterly reports. And then the principal researcher will uh, give periodic presentations. And this is um, as requested by the, the key stakeholders. Um, uh, and there could also be additional quality control response uh, processes put in place. So I hope that covers the um, governance and the communication part. There's also a part there that's not really highlighted, which is our project management system. So once we've got the project management system up and running, there'll be a portal for researchers to log in through the portal and provide uh, progress reports through the portal. Um, and look, that brings us to the end of the webinar. I'll pass it back to John if he's got any further Q and A's or, uh, to go through and then the final wrap up. John, over to you. Yeah, thanks Shiva. Um, if you do have any, any final Q and A, uh, yep, we've got one coming through now. Let me just go and click on that one. Um, what does it mean peer review? Uh, peer review means that you have had it, you've had the report reviewed by someone who is an expert in the field um, to make sure that uh, who is unrelated to the project or independent from the project to to make sure that it is there is nothing in there that's inconsistent that is not referenced in the appropriate way. So it's it's a it's a way it's a quality control review that we asked the successful uh, team to make sure is undertaken before the final report is submitted to us. Um, so thank you everybody for, for being part of the webinar today. Um, 
and the message in the chat I hear. Uh, I've not seen any mention of the project durational budget. Um, the information on the um, the budget was in the EOI, I believe. Um, I'm not going to give the number off the top of my head. I think I know what it is, but I'll, we'll get someone to to check that and put that information uh, out there. Um, I will, whilst we're sitting here, I will just click onto the link. So the project budget is 150 up to 150,000 exclusive of GST. That that is in the tender, the EOI document, and the estimated duration is about nine months, give or take. So uh, that information is there, and I would encourage everybody that's interested in in responding to this to make sure that you've read the expression of interest, and I think importantly make sure that you've paid attention to the assessment criteria that are there because we will be reviewing. Um, the proposals on that basis. Uh, Shiva, I get you to stop sharing at the moment and we can go back to full screen. Um, and oh, thank you, I'm big now. Uh, see, just going on with that, the as I mentioned earlier, our new website did go live today. We, we have heard that there are some glitches in it. If you're looking for a document that you are uh, and, and you are unable to download or, or unable to find it, please send a, a an email to research at naturalhazards.com.au and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, we are hoping and anticipating that we will have uh, this recording up on the website by the end of the week. So that will be by close of business Friday, Melbourne time. Uh, and the responses to the questions will go up in the Q&A as soon as we can get them up there. Um, before we all go, I would like to encourage those of you that are not yet subscribed to our monthly net newsletter to do that. Um, that is a way of, of um, finding out what we're doing, what new projects are coming, what events we're running, to visit the news page on our website and sign up to get that, um, we also, which is the way that we provide uh, information about EOIs that are coming up, project updates and events. And it's a really good way to, just to understand where the centre's at and what it's doing. So with that, I would like to thank you all for participating today. I'm hoping that many of you will go and proceed with an expression of interest. Um, as Shiva mentioned earlier, it's a two-step process. The, the first step is a relatively um, short form approach. We're trying to make sure that um, the people who are proposing to undertake the work understand it and, and have a sound methodology for moving forward. And, and that once we get to, to the short list of a, a one or, or a small number, that uh, only then do we require a fully detailed submission uh, trying to minimize the work um, thank you all for your interest and thank you for participating today and, and to my team at Natural Hazards Research Australia, those, those of us that you saw and the team behind the scenes that have put all this together, thank you. Uh, on that, unless there are any final questions, uh, we'll close off for today and thank you all for joining and being with us and I look forward to reading um, and, look, and selecting one of the expressions of interest from the process. Thank you very much.